Hi, everybody. Welcome. I am Jordan Richardson, the Local Catch Network Coordinator. And on behalf of the Local Catch Network Executive Committee, we're very happy that you all are able to join us today. I'd love to learn a little bit more about who is joining us on the call today. So if you could drop your name in the organization or business that you're associated with and where you're calling in from in the chat um, to kick us off and get us started here. The Local Catch Network is a community of practice that's made up of fishermen, organizers, researchers, and consumers across North America, all of whom are committed to providing local, helpful, low impact, and sustainable seafood via community supported fisheries, which is kind of like the equivalent to CSAs and other direct marketing arrangements. The network is supported by an executive committee and has institutional support from North American Marine Alliance and the University of Maine. We are recording this session today and we'll plan to share the link of the recording and additional resources after the session. We encourage you all to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen throughout the session and for this to be a conversational session. Um, so whenever you guys have questions, feel free again to drop them in the chat or raise your hand or um, go ahead and, and call out um, so we know. Um, what questions you all have. So if you guys are here for um, to learn a, bit, a little bit more about USDA grants, specifically the Farmers Market Promotion Program and the Local Foods Promotion Program, you're in the right place. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a presentation here for you all, and we will kick it off. Oh, I'm having, okay, so now I'm having a little bit of trouble <laughs> with the presentation here. All right, can you guys all see that presentation on the screen? Okay, perfect. So, We are going to start um, with a very high level overview of LAMP and FL, FMLFPP grant programs. Um, we are going to be talking a little bit about how to become an application reviewer. We're gonna spend a majority of our time um, talking with grants management specialist, Kim Harmon, who is on the call today. Thank you so much for being with us. And then also additional uh, technical assistance that Local Catch Network is going to be offering in partnership with USDA. As you all may know, USDA um, recently announced that they're investing $92.2 million in grants to increase local food access, including seafood, through direct and intermediary producer to consumer markets. The Agricultural Marketing Service has partnered with 11 organizations, including Local Catch Network, to provide outreach and technical assistance with a focus on socially disadvantaged rural and other historically underrepresented grant applicants. Um, so like I said, we are just gonna do a very brief high level overview of the programs, and then we are gonna open it up to a Q&A for all of the amazing questions I'm sure you all have. So, LAMP. Um, LAMP grants support the development and coordination and expansion of direct to producer, producer to consumer marketing, local and regional food markets, enterprises, and value added agricultural products. Again, specifically today, we're going to be focusing mainly on the farmers market promotion program and the local food promotion program, but the regional food partnership program and the value added producer grants also fall under the LAMP umbrella. As you can see from this screen, this is a high level overview of all of the programs that USDA um, has available to people along the food, food supply chain. So this is a really great tool if you are interested in applying for funding or looking for additional support. Um, if you look at the, um, the row in yellow at the top, so land conservation, production, processing, um, and distribution, um, this is a really good place to start if you're not really sure 
what um, exactly areas that you should be looking for in terms of funding or support. Um, so if you, for instance, have um, a value added product that you want to be working on, um, you might wanna look under the processing column or the aggregation and distribution um, column. Um, if you are looking for, again, that direct market support um, or focus on consumers, uh, you can look in that column and see what programs may be available to help support you in your projects. Oopsies. We're gonna dive right into the Farmers Market Promotion Program, also known as FMPP. So FMPP specifically focuses on expanding those direct to consumer markets of local and regional food. Um, there are two types of FMPP projects that we're gonna um, briefly touch on today. The first one being the capacity building FMPP. So capacity building project, projects help build long-term organizational capacity of direct producer to consumer markets. Um, and these, again, since it is talking about direct producer to consumers should involve farmers, ranchers, fishermen in com community organizations. Um, and these projects specifically show how they can directly benefit um, local farms, uh, fishing areas and ranches. Um, some examples of eligible projects include a market analysis and strategic planning for a direct producer to consumer market opportunity. So I, I like to think of this as maybe a new farmer's market that is coming into play um, or expansion of that farmer's market. There's also the community development training and technical assistant FMPP. So this specific category of projects provides outreach training and technical assistance to farms, ranches, fishermen operations serving local markets and other parties interested in expanding direct producer to consumer market opportunities. So Local Catch Network actually, actually received one of these grants in the fiscal year 2020. Um, and so an example of one of the activities that we are working on is we have partnered with EcoTrust um, to build out a technical assistance program for fishermen who are interested in expanding um, and growing their direct to consumer uh, sales. Um, so we're offering some business development training around, um, around that. We're gonna quickly go and talk about, I just wanted to point this out and say that um, the two different projects, areas that you can apply for, again, capacity building, community development, training and technical assistance have different amounts of funding available. So as you can see, capacity building, um, you can apply for $50,000 to uh, $500,000. And then the community development and training and technical assistance, that is actually um, a higher amount that you can apply for. Um, both have the same grant periods and both require either a 10 or a 25% match. I also wanted to make note that there are some ineligible activities for FMPP. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but again, since FMPP is very much focused on um, benefiting producers, um, we want to make sure that multiple producers are benefited by the projects that you all are considering. Um, you, all of the uh, critical infrastructure should be in place before you apply for funding. Um, and then there are a couple of other things to note. And all of these are outlined on the RFA. So if you have specific questions about what activities are ineligible, um, USDA has done a really amazing job outlining those in the RFA. We are gonna dive right into the Local Food Promotion Program, so also known as LFPP. And LFPP is a little bit different from FMPP because these projects focus on the intermediary, intermediary or indirect to consumer enterprises, um, but also still has a focus on increasing access to local and regional food. Um, and much like FMPP, there are two types of LFPP um, projects that you can apply for. Um, the first one is uh, planning. Um, so planning projects are used to support the planning stages of a food business, which supports local and regional food systems. Um, so an example of this is if you are maybe considering creating a value added um, product, so maybe you are um, thinking about producing smoked salmon and 
um, selling that, then this could be a really great plan or a really great project um, area for you to apply for. So you can develop a business plan um, in order to create that value added agricultural product. But remember that um, USDA is really looking uh, for the projects that benefit more than one producer. There's also the implementation implementation LFPP. So um, these projects establish new food businesses or expand upon an existing food business with which benefits the local and regional food system. So an example of this is maybe there's a food hub um, that's aggregating um, different types of seafood and you want to launch an online portal or virtual marketing place um, in response to COVID or just increase that um, increase the sale of that local product in the community. So um, much like FMPP, there are two application types that you can uh, plan for, which we just spoke about. Um, and there are, again, differing amounts of funding for each of those. So for the planning um, projects, you can you can request anywhere between $25,000 or $200,000. You still are required for, um, to make that 10 or 25% match. The planning actually has um, a shorter timeline. So you have a 24 month grant period and the implementation um, has a higher amount of funding available in the 36 month grant period. So like FMPP, the LFPP also has ineligible activities um, again, infrastructure must be in place, critical infrastructure must be in place, must benefit more than one agricultural producer. Um, and yes, many of these others are outlined in the RFA and we can dig a little bit deeper into these if you guys have questions about them during our q and I'm gonna just briefly touch on the Regional Food Systems Partnership. We're not gonna be talking much about this today, but the RFA is open for um, and accepting applications um, right now for the Regional Food Systems Partnership. Um, there are two types of projects. And if you're interested in learning more about this specific grant opportunity, we have other partners. Um, I believe the Wallace Center might be heading up more technical assistance around this specific uh, grant. And so we can direct you to the appropriate people if you have questions about this. So there are some changes that were made in 2021. Um, we've gone over a couple of those, but we're gonna highlight a few more. Um, so there's $76.9 million available for the FMLFPP um, in 2021. And that funding will be divided equally between the FMPP and the LFPP. Um, so that's gonna be $38.5 million available for each of those grant programs. So there are three funding sources um, that, that this $38.5 million is coming from, um, and that's annual funding, um, the farm bill, and then the, there's stimulus funding. And there are some differences between the three of these, and that is mainly gonna be that match um, percent that um, is required of all applicants. So match requirements, um, you will either, when you apply, you're going to have to decide whether you um, are applying for a 10% match or a 25% um, and make note of that. Um, these matches can be in-kind or cash matches. Um, so in-kind could be um, the calculated salary of somebody or um, I believe volunteer hours. And we'll double check with Kim about that. Um, but all applications will re be reviewed together with the same criteria and review process and high ranking projects will be awarded. The match amount provided by the applicant will determine the funding source AMS will use to make an award. So the award process, applicants must commit again to the one of those match amounts. So either the 10% or the 25%. Um, and you can't replicate the same application and submit them with different match amounts. We might, I might have Kim kind of go over a little bit more the difference between these match amounts and um, 
and how those are going to be divvied up um, once grant funding is awarded. So project activities that respond to COVID-19 are encouraged, but they're not required for a project to be funded. So if you do have a specific project that is responding to COVID-19, this could be a really great year to apply for funding um, for those specific types of projects. Um, the remainder of the eligible entities and activities um, are still in place from previous years. So let's talk a little bit about becoming an application reviewer. So USDA is currently seeking, seeking reviewers for grant proposals. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are encouraged to apply to become reviewers. No travel or prior, prior experience is required. And then training is provide, provided by USDA. Um, and if you're selected to be a reviewer, um, you, will you can receive a stipend for your participation. Uh, reviewers should expect to complete reviews within four to six weeks. I was a LFPP reviewer last year and I'll say it was a really great experience and gives you kind of insight into how the application process works and how the review process works to get a better idea. If you're thinking about applying um, in future years, um, I believe you can also be a reviewer if you're applying uh, for funding this year. So um, they are on the search for reviewers and I encourage you all to check it out and apply if you're interested. So I am going to go ahead and pass it off to our special guest, Kim. Again, she is a USDA Grants Management Specialist. Um, she is a wealth of knowledge and I really wanna open this time up and encourage you guys to ask questions. Um, put them in the chat, raise your hand, um, or um, you can shout them out. And then Josh Stoll will be helping to facilitate those questions. Good, okay. good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot, Jordan, for taking the time to, to walk through um, these grant opportunities. As, as Jordan said, um, uh, we're fortunate to have Kim uh, with us today to uh, field questions, and we really see this as an opportunity um, uh, to have a dialogue with you all about um, issues or opportunities or, or, or thoughts you might have about these two RFPs. Um, I think there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, you can either feel free to add questions in the chat box, um, or if you'd like to ask the question verbally, if you wouldn't mind, there's a little reaction button at the bottom of your screen and you can click the raise hand icon and I'll call on you um, with that. So I'm, I'm gonna start with a question that's in the chat already for you, Kim, and that is, um, there's a question about the reviewers and how long it, um, uh, how many hours will it take. Um, so if you wouldn't mind offering some reflection on that, that would be fa fabulous. Great, great question. And, and folks, it's, it's a really good opportunity. Uh, you can apply for a reviewer. If you're applying for an LFPP, you can, you can apply to review on the FMPP. This year, we're, it's going to be only about four weeks that uh, we're, we really, because of the lateness of this uh, application, we're trying to get it to where the reviewers only have three to four weeks to do the review. Uh, it'll be a panel of three uh, with a, with a uh, team lead. You'll have, depending on the number of applications, uh, we're trying to get between 10 and 15 applications for you to review. The criteria on the scoring is at the back of the RFA and you'll use that criteria to score. You'll look at it as an individual and score. Then the team will get together uh, via conference or Zoom and go over the applications that they reviewed and they will rank them as a team together. So one through 15 or one through 20. Then they'll let us know that they're, they're completed then what we'll do is say we have 30 teams. I think last year we had 30 teams. The ad, then we'll take over on the admin review of those um, applications. But, Thank you, Kim. Uh, mm -hmm. can, can I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, uh, our understanding is that there is some 
form of stipend available to people who yes. do reviews. And I think it's important to acknowledge that you're not asking for people's time for free. Uh, would you just comment on that briefly? Sure. Uh, they, I'm, I can't remember how much it is, but you do get a stipend. Uh, the team lead will get a little bit more, I think maybe a hundred bucks more. Um, if you're a federal employee, then you don't get paid. It's all for free. Um, but uh, if you're just an industry stakeholder and you apply, you will get a stipend. It's all being handled through grant solutions. But we have uh, contracted with them and they'll be the ones that um, will, they'll, you'll get the money through them. We've, we found that it works out a little faster and easier to uh, have this third party that's in control of this and it keeps it all unbiased. Thank you, Kim. And I'll just, since this is a group of people who focus on fisheries, I would just make a plug for fisheries related people signing up to do this reviewing. Um, I think it's really valuable to have reviewers who are subject matter experts. And historically, these grants have not been very well accessed by the fishing industry. And so the more people we have in this space, uh, likely the, the better off um, your applications will be received. Um, so with that, I want to turn to, uh, it looks like Julie Lofstad, uh, you have your hand up. Um, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and pose your question. Okay, I, I have like eight questions. Can I ask all eight or do you want me to um, just pick a couple? Why don't you start with a couple? Um, it seems like we have quite a few people with their hands up and then okay. uh, if they aren't answered, we'll, we'll come back to you. Okay, first, uh, this is an easy one. Can we get a copy of this PowerPoint? Yes, absolutely. We will send this out to everyone after the, the call. Okay. So my first question is, is uh, I had asked some questions last night and got some answers and some partial answers. So um, it says that USDA grants require partnerships. How do we prove a partnership? We're, we're a local commercial fishing family who support other commercial fishing boats. Is that considered a partnership? No, uh, partnership was, okay, your project idea that you're applying for, uh, the partner is, is, is not affiliated with you as the entity that is applying. They are a separate organization or a business and they are actually rolling up their sleeves and participating in this project. It's not just a uh, letter of support or, but they, they actually have to be committed to doing that. So it could be, it could be some of the other commercial fisher, fisheries that um, are participating in, say you're, if you're doing like a food hub or doing a planning grant for a food hub, they're partnering with you on that. Uh, there are partnership letters, uh, templates on uh, our uh, website. When you go on to the local food promotion program or the farmer's market promotion program, on the left-hand side, you'll see how to apply. You click on that and in the middle uh, is all of the templates, the project narratives budget template, the match letter templates, the infrastructure template and uh, the partnership templates. So these guys are going out and rolling up their sleeves. They're out there fishing every day and don't have time to bring their product direct to consumer. We help them with that. Um, and and I, I'm not quite sure why that wouldn't be a partnership, but okay. Um, my next question is about expanding value added products to um, traditional fishing. We sent our fish to Hunts Point or one of the big New York City markets or Boston. Um, now our value added to me is anything that we do on top of that, which is farmers markets or direct deliveries to, to customers. Um, so do you agree that for grant purposes, anything other than what we traditionally have done in the past would be value added or is there a specific definition for value added? There's a specific uh, definition for value added. Value added is like you have, uh, you have that fish. Well, now you have made it into um, something else. You, it's not just the whole fish or the half fish. You, it's not just the filet. You have done something to enhance it to, to, as a, to another product like the smoked 
salmon, as she uh, did an example earlier. It's not just because you're going to a different market. Okay, so this kind of cuts down on my question. So I'll have one last one and let other people go. So uh, equipment covered. So again, we do farmers markets. Is equipment tents and scales and tables um, covered? And if we have receipts for that, because it says that critical infrastructure should be in place. So I've already purchased my tent and my extra tables for the uh, 10 or 11 farmers markets we do. Would that be um, covered under a grant? Uh, we have covered uh, canopies and tables and stuff for a farmer's market that is expanding to uh, supply their vendors. Now, if you already have that, uh, I don't know, that is, it has to be already, if you're using it, you can use it as a match. Uh, the infrastructure is as if you have the, uh, where the farmer's market is taking place and it's, um, or the, the food hub, the infrastructure has to be there. It's not uh, the infrastructure as far as your canopy. If you're just a, a vendor, that's not really what we're talking about as far as that's not considered infrastructure. The infrastructure is the actual farmer's market area. Okay, so, so a, a vendor, which would be a fisherman who has tried to pivot their business is not considered eligible for these grants because they're not the actual manager of a farmer's market. Is that what I'm understanding? No, ma'am. What I'm saying is that um, you're as you're, it's not that you're going to the different farmer's market is if, if you're establishing a farmer's market. So you and, and a couple of other fishermen and maybe some produce folks and maybe some uh, meat folks are starting a farmer's market. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll connect with you guys offline. I think that I have some very specific questions. I don't wanna take up everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, appreciate those questions. Uh, I'm gonna go to Ronald Williams. It looks like uh, your hand was up first and then you might have lowered it and then you dropped to the end of the line. So I'm going to go go with you. Next. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, because I was understanding what Miss Kim was saying. So basically, we're in uh, Lower Anacostia in Washington, D.C. Uh, the partnership would be um, two businesses that are willing to give us their parking lot and their backyard space with because I'm a crabber, a Maryland waterman and a farmer, but we have four other farms that are on the Eastern shore, five other crabbers that need to get their product into other markets, but don't have a market structure. So we, we were going to apply, uh, well, me personally, I was going to apply and apply as a reviewer, but we were going to do diversify things. So even though all of us are crabbers, we're not going to all be selling crabs. One will sell opilio crab, one would sell Maryland crab, one would sell Maryland oysters, the other would sell uh, Maryland produce or Maryland peaches. Um, and we have the infrastructure in place. Um, would that, would that uh, be eligible, just the planning, the, the feasibility, um, the, the, the potential salaries of the market assistants and manager? or salaries aren't covered in this? No, yes, yes. So, so Ronald, so your, your partners are gonna be the folks that where you're gonna have the farmer's market, the, the, the lot, the parking lot or the, and that building. So that's one, that's, those are your partners and yourself and then you've got your others. So you've got your partnerships done that everyone's gonna be doing part of that. Uh, Ms. Kim, not to cut you off, but 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 I think uh, the previous reviewer was trying to say so like should I submit that collective letter of all of our names in that packet to you guys to prove that partnership or how should we how should we prove to you all that we're not doing nothing uh, you know fishy or shaky basically we're not saying something that we ain't doing right well in your each each partner has to do a letter. As, as we have in the RFA and in the instructions Got that it. each partner and they describe what they're doing, their, their uh, 
account their accountable assigned parts of that project is this, this, and this. It's the same as a mat, and if they're matching, they have to have a whole separate letter for matching. We're going to have on June 1st a webinar that goes over the entire um, application process. And it's uh, at our, if you go onto our website, uh, the main website where you can pick any of the uh, grants down below in additional resources, there's this little thing that says grant webinars. The first one is May 25th and that is on grants.gov. Grants.gov uh, staff will be uh, going over how to make sure that you're registered as a user and how to use the grants.gov because that's where you apply. And then ours is going to be June 1st for the farmer's market and local food. Hey, Ms. Kim, last question. Would, would according, um, and this is in regards to the match, if we have sponsors like local businesses that uh, will give us monetary donations to start the market, um, could that be considered the match? And should we submit those letters with the package as well? Yes, and yes, uh, that would be considered a match, a cash match. Okay. And they would. Sorry, uh, that's my toddler in the background. That's that's okay. Uh, hey, uh, COVID has made us, you know, kind of ignore stuff like that. Um, it'll be a cash match, and it, you will need a letter for each match, whether it's in kind or cash. And as I I tell folks, it, it's kind of good to have a combination of cash and in kind. I have had previous grantees that did all in kind and they get almost to the end and some of those in kind matches never developed they were going to have uh, they were going to have other producers help man the farmers market and stuff and they got too busy and all of a sudden they're scrambling to find cash to meet fulfill that match so you want a kind of a combination and you and you want those letters those match letters are very important because that's an accountability. You have promised me this for a, for this project. Thank you, Ronald, for those questions. I'm going to go to a question that's in the chat, and and that is about the number of um, proposals an organization can submit. This is from Susan Olds Olska. Uh, and the question is, can the same organization apply for both types of grants? I, I think referring to LFMP, LMPP and FMPP. Yes, you can. Uh, you can apply for an FMPP and an LFPP, and you can be awarded both, but it cannot be the same project. It has to Thank be you. different projects. And if you, you can apply, if you've got two great ideas that you think fit FMPP or LFPP and you can apply. If they're both ranked very high and are selected, then we will come to you and you can only pick one. Uh, if you have LFPP A project and LFPP B project and they both uh, are high ranked, uh, we you can only have one LFPP. So you can, you choose between A and B. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Emma Kramer. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. All right. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, my question is in regards to the LFPP grants. We have a proposal for an implementation project. And uh, being a part of the Alaska Food Hub is our main objective. We propose that our business is the anchor business to allow other vendors to share cold storage and a freezer van. Um, so the three specific questions are about eligible expenses. The first is, as part of this plan, we need to uh, pay the personnel, but then also offer this liability insurance for the ability to drive across the Kenai Peninsula and deliver. So the second eligibility question is in terms of cold storage. Uh, we experience a lot of power outages and our proposal is for two chest freezers, each being under 5,000. 
Uh, so I'm hoping that that qualifies. And then finally, uh, as we advance in this, um, we struggle with being able to afford moorage in the harbor. So we always have to pull our boat, which doesn't allow us to process and distribute fish. So the third question is in regards to eligibility for vessel moorage. Thank you. Okay. So the first question, uh, so is this a planning grant or an actual implementation? Sorry, hold on. Sorry, guys. Uh, so repeat, go, uh, Emma, it's one at a time, okay? Implementation grant. First question, okay. I, it seems personnel, uh, the salary can be covered. I'm wondering about liability insurance for that person. Okay, uh, if that is a normal for you, for, salaries are covered. Salaries for the project work itself are covered. Yeah. So that would be a food hub manager or assistant manager. It would be anybody that works in the food hubs. That could be a farmer's market manager, assistant manager, all of that. Uh, if they're normally, the liability insurance is the fringes are normal that, okay. and it, that's what they're normally paid, then yes on okay. that. Great. For the salary. But it's the only question, for the project, it's only for the project time. Yep. Second question was about the chest freezers. Um, it's the best way for us to share cold storage. So I know equipment under 5,000 can be approved, so. Yes, yes, as long as there's no construction involved in, the, uh, uh, in those chest freezers. We have, had, we have done uh, chest freezers and chest refrigerators for food hubs and commercial kitchens and uh, light processing, so yes. And then those particular chest freezers have solar panels and battery backups because we experience frequent power outages, again, under 5,000. So I understand yeah, if that, you can't answer I, that one. That but. I don't know. We'll have to okay. That's cool. look into that because <sighs> If there's construction involved into getting those solar panels up, then the answer is no. Construction in terms of just mounting brackets on a roof. That is but correct. Then, I understand. Yeah. The other the other question is done in regards to vessel moorage as part of the infrastructure for our anchoring to the food hub. Can, um, we'll have to, I'll have to check on that, Emma, because I am not sure. Yeah, since that's great. No worries. Thank you, Emma. I appreciate those. I appreciate it. Thank you. you bet. Thank you so much for those questions, Emma. I think you may win the award for the snowiest call person calling in uh, today. Let's, let's go from um, Alaska to Maine and, and Togbrong. Tog Braun has a question about uh, eligibility of a project. Um, she writes, would an update to a direct to consumer website uh, to make it more nimble, better uh, able to accommodate last minute uh, fish orders be an eligible expense? And then there's a second um, related question. And that is, um, we say that, or you say that the availability amounts are twenty five to two hundred thousand dollars. Does that mean you can't ask for less than twenty five thousand? You you can ask for less, but um, and and I think we've had that before. I mean, you certainly can. Uh, but you want to really look at your budget when you when you fill out that project narrative there is a budget on there there's a timeline for the project and a budget and so you really need to go through there and look at realistic budgets for that entire time frame on that um we have had some what she's asking on the on the on the web thing, yeah, it, it it if it if it falls within whatever project she is applying for, and that is part of it, then then yes, 
I know with this COVID, we've had to pivot on a lot of the in-person to some online stuff and curbside. And so they, those were allowable. Thank you. We're, let's go to Butch's phone. Um, I assume we'll be hearing from Butch and not his phone. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself when you get a second. While he works on unmuting himself, um, I'm going to go to a question online uh, on the chat from Don uh, McAllister, and this is about. Um, quote unquote, separate projects. Um, if there are several different projects um, uh, that uh, projects in the works by different organizations, um, should they apply, uh, be applied for individually or should they uh, work and collaborate in a collaboration of a, an application? And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that these projects might be in some ways coupled you have any recommendations on individual projects versus collaborative projects? Uh, I mean, if, if they fit together, uh, you can uh, find them in, in one project. Uh, if it looks like it's, you know, stage one, stage two, and stage three, you know, of, of a project within that three years. But you have to remember it's a three-year grant. And um, also you, it's only three years and you don't want to squirrel around. You, you want a minimum of three, maybe four objectives. I've had some that have had seven and, and up to 10 objectives. And it's like, you're, you're, you're never going to get the end of the tunnel, the light at that end of the tunnel with all, it's like you're going all, all these ways. So narrow it in and make it a good solid, project. Um, I can expand upon that a little bit. Um, yeah, please do. Thank you. This is Dawn. Um, so uh, I've been advocating um, for local seafood um, in Rhode Island, um, specifically for uh, the development of community supported fisheries in Rhode Island. Um, there's a little bit of a presence, but we need more um, last year for COVID, the fishermen were allowed to sell direct from their boats. Um, so I've launched um, I've launched a community outreach campaign. Um, and there's another individual in Rhode Island who I've recently connected with and learned that he's in process of um, opening a facility. So basically, what we're doing kind of enmeshes together. So basically, his his facility is providing um, access to get our local seafood into the local community. And my efforts are more focused on educating the community on our local species that are not available in the regular supermarkets um, and, and teaching them um, things like how to fillet your own fish um, and things of that nature. So our efforts are kind of in line and we have a really, um, Rhode Island is really starting to catch up um, and there's a, there's a lot of organizations involved um, with providing different things like the Rhode Island Food Policy Council is working with the Commercial Fishery Center on a uh, food, seafood donation program that's in progress. Um, just every, everybody seems to be doing something and we're all learning about what each other is doing. So um, would, it, would, it be, would it be better for these individual organizations to apply for their own individual projects or come together as like one whole collaborative unit with several different projects intertwined within, I guess is my question. Well, you there's your partners. Uh, and what I would do is as a group, hone in on maybe two or three of those 
top ones. Now, the I can tell you that donation thing will probably not uh, be a good fit because uh, that's one of the unallowables. We don't do anything. The grants aren't used to buy food to resell or buy food to donate. So if it kind of looking like, and it, you may not be doing, you may be just establishing how to do that, but it, that's not really our mission. So that's not a good project fit for, for the grant. Uh, the others sounded like real good ones and you can, you've, that's your one, your, your partners right there. And you've got, you've got, uh, three objectives or four objectives, which are your, uh, uh, the activities that that you were mentioning, Dawn. So that's where that's where I'd go with it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to to Butch and see if um, it looked like you uh, were able to unmute yourself. Um, uh, so if you want to do that and ask your question, please do. Hey, can you hear us now? Yes, yes we can. Awesome. Sorry about that. We're out cleaning oysters out on the boat right now. So, well, you know, it's te technical difficulties. Um, so next, next year, we're going to be, our cooperative is hosting a oyster festival um, where we're going to feature, you know, local oysters from about three dozen different growers. But we're also focusing on um, some other products that we have, like kelp, scallops, things like that. And I'm just wondering about using the grant to pay for a lot of the infrastructure that we need for each of the individual growers. Uh, State of Maine needs to have a hand wash station wherever you shop oysters, for example. Uh, that seemed like something that we could, we could do, and it would be great because it's something we're planning on doing every year to introduce the public to our product, but also introduce um, chefs and restaurateurs to our products. We have, we have um, our various farmers markets and some of my food hubs have uh, had washing stations, uh, whether it's for the public to get into their, uh, into their farmers market with the COVID or with them packaging, aggregating the stuff. So we've had that. Um, the festival thing, I, I'll have to look at that. Uh, I'll give my email and stuff at the end of this and then maybe email me. I'll have to look into that. I know that we do some agritourism. Yep. And that would be considered, but I don't know whether that can be the main project. Sure. Yeah, I, I would love to touch base with you offline and, and give you the whole outline of the, the uh, Oyster Festival. And, you know, if nothing else, you should come. The more, we we want to have as many people come as we can. So we're, we're hoping for, you know, hundreds of thousands of people eating oysters. That's our plan. Well, I do, I do know this. I mean, our sister uh, program, the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, that's the funding that goes to the state departments and territories of ag. And I know through reading some of the annual reports for that, that they have had projects through that specialty crop block that was totally for like a festival type of agritourism. Sure. That, so that that might, might, well, we're, we're working with our state department of tourism too. So we can talk to them and yeah, talk to them, talk to them and see, and see that also, Butch, I would uh, ask them if they, uh, uh, to contact their specialty crop block grant director in the Department of Ag and okay. see as well, because that might be a better fit. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here from... Um, Seth about ongoing projects. So they have an ongoing project that's connecting fishermen, processors, and food banks as part of a response to COVID-19. There's a lot of this work happening across the country right now. And um, the question is about continuing that work. Um, 
uh, after donor support diminishes. And do you have any right, Josh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great oh, go ahead. Yeah, you, let me just, Kim, I'll just add in quickly. So we've had major philanthropic support to work with our local fishermen, local processor, local chowder maker to make a chowder that we've been distributing around the Northeast and helping to support food banks and food pantries where there's a lot of food insecurity in our communities. That philanthropic support will be ending shortly. And what we're trying to do is create a sustainable program here out of this model that we begin to move into food service, perhaps at universities and colleges where they've expressed interest to purchase and other forms of distribution, perhaps retail, wholesale. So we're trying to build sustainability off of a project that was donor based to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and we're wondering which of the programs that you're describing here might be the one that would help get us some support to really think this through. The planning grant for the local food. And we've actually, I've had a couple of different ones. Um, if you're familiar with, is it, is it Red Tomato out of Massachusetts? They did one with uh, second and third tomatoes and they did a marinara and with their, in their commercial kitchen, they went and sold that marinara to higher institutes as well as restaurants. We got um, some of them down here in DC. Yes, yes. And then I, I also had some, um, I had one in North Carolina that did flash freezing of uh, vegetables out of North Carolina. And uh, what we did was that flash freezing equipment is so expensive. And of course it changes because it has the nitrates. So his match was supplying the nitrogen, uh, the nitrates to do the flash freezing. And then, but he leased, uh, his, part of his grant was leasing that equipment because, you know, he didn't have to purchase it and it's always changing. The, in two years, the next model is even better. It's kind of like your, your cars, how they, oh, you don't need, you know, type of thing. And it was more economical for him to lease that type of equipment. So when you're, um, the other thing I wanted to go, I have a 2020 right now. At a, Louisiana is one of my states. So I, I've got a little bit of the fish stuff with it. Uh, it's Twin Parish. They have a farmer's market. It's on the pier. They have it to where their fishermen come in. They do a, um, they sell off the boats. They, uh, let folks know what uh, what boats are coming in and what kind of fish or shrimp or crawfish or whatever they have. A uh, part of their farmers market, they we bought one of those. They uh, applied part of it was for a trailer that was a setup for a, like a little kitchen, and then they would bring in chefs to cook, demonstrate what uh, kind of meals they could make with the fresh catch that was there and the produce that was there. Uh, now the 2020 is uh, with um, uh, uh, one, uh, one of the, the university's marine thing. They have an old um, building that they are doing a planning grant for a food hub processing facility for the boats to come in to do the processing and maybe cry backing of their uh, stuff to, to uh, send out in there in Louisiana um, on that. So those are kind of some ideas as well. That's great, Kim. Thank you. I don't mean to uh, take too much time, but just so to clarify, you're saying that the planning grant for local food would be good for a project like this. And you're also <laughs> saying that you do not support any food donations or resale so that if we wanted to keep a component going, where we're supporting our local food banks, that would knock us out? Well, you're, you, you're, you're, you're going, you were saying that you were going to look into uh, to selling this product. So Correct. we want to do that in part to support our food banks. Right. None of the food, none of the giveaway stuff can be part of it. 
But but again, okay. I, at the end, we we can talk offline on on that, and I can try to figure out on that. There's a, there's a very fine line on on that. But your the the planning the planning grant would get you the set up your business plans and and everything as well. Yeah. Or if you sense. already have all of that stuff, you can go into the implementation grant. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, a question here about Project Fit from Amaya. Um, and this is about um, uh, understanding what the right uh, program uh, opportunity would be for a project, a market analysis around bringing ocean farmed products, mussels to low income communities in Los Angeles. Uh, that partner with uh, a range of different people. So any thoughts on a, on the market analysis? Okay, I'm sorry, uh, I had to take a call to keep it from ringing. Can you repeat? Sure, um, this is a question about um, project fit or, or program fit. So there's a, a project around a market analysis uh, for bringing ocean farmed products, specifically mussels to low income communities in Los Angeles. And so what would be the, the appropriate program for a market analysis like that? Well, it's, a, it's, it's in your, it would be LFPP because if it's a long, as long as it's an indirect, you're not the, the main catcher of the oysters and, and mussels and stuff. Uh, uh, th there are other oyster folks and stuff involved and you're just kind of the middle person. So that would be, but if it is, a, if it's direct, you can apply through that commute, what is it, the CB that has the analysis, but uh, LFPP, the planning grant. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Maine, from uh, Bo Marsh around, uh, would media production of short educational videos and related articles about various seafood products qualify if the intent is to motivate direct consumer sales? It, it all depends on how it's written and, and what the intent is it can't be general. It has to be a little, it has to be specific on that. But it, the, again, a lot of that is in the RFA on, on allowables, on the, on the uh, advertising and media. It's, it's under the allowables. A lot of that stuff, folks, we can't, we can't do because the two CFR 200 says no, and that's the federal rigs. And I'm assuming somebody like Bo could reach out to you directly to, to work that out. Sure. Yes. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go to Susan uh, Olcott. Uh, it looks like your hand is up. Feel free to unmute yourself. And then I'll come back to the rest of our chat questions. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, I just wanted to jump on. Uh, Seth and I were chatting offline. I'm, I am new to Maine Fishermen, Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. and. We have a similar program. And so Seth, I just wanted to connect with you and um, some of the grant people to say, if we have a conversation about the issues you're thinking about with your program, maybe we could also be a part of that conversation to address those questions at the same time, because we're trying to figure out how to continue the donation too. Thanks, Susan. Um, Thank you, Josh. We have a couple more questions, and I'm going to turn it back over to, to Jordan, um, uh, the Local Catch Network. We have a, a few different uh, technical assistance opportunities, including um, some opportunities for one-on-one -on -one support um, that I, I want to make sure we have enough time for Jordan to chat about. Um, but we have a, a question from Alaska from Melina Marvin about um, the best fit for the creation of some type of um, trade association focused specifically on Alaska direct marketing. Um, uh, would facilitate branding, but also things like mentorship and the development and growth of direct marketing businesses. Any recommendations for appropriate grant 
uh, programs. Okay. Now, was it to to establish a trade association that we can't do? I'll let. It looks like Melina, you just uh, unmuted yourself, so I'd, I'd invite you to uh, feel free to to elaborate on your question. Yeah, I, this is for fishing for direct market fishing businesses. Um, not looking for USDA to DA to establish, but for assistance or um, some of the program areas that a direct marketing trade group might pursue. And I, I, I put two program areas that seemed like they might fit. One would be mentorship of up and coming direct marketers, mentorship of fishermen to direct market. And then the other might be to brand and market us as a trade group and not just individual businesses. I am not sure about the second that the second suggestion. The other one could be part of the activities for a project because you're do that would be considered um, by doing the business plans, the outreach uh, type of uh, things. I ha we've had some um, projects that have had like a mentorship, but they've also done. Um, the toolkits. I have had a couple of folks that have um, organizations that there was to put together a toolkit. So it could be putting together a toolkit for your fisher uh, people thinking about getting into the fishing business, or maybe they're working. And in order for them to have their own boat or be a captain, you would have a, another set kind of, is that kind of what you're saying? Because I have some, I have some folks that have done toolkits for farmers market managers and uh, stuff like that. And that we've had grants for that. Our, our grants have been, a, they've been awarded to those folks for doing that. And which, which grants are, I'm just trying to figure out which of those ones that you kind of listed out would be the best fit for that kind of work? Um, it would be the, the second one for the uh, farmer's market, which was the, uh, the, the technical support one, the Q, uh, CB, CT, I, I never, it's the, that second one of, a, CB, of the TTA. farmer's market. Yes, the, the second, the farmer's market, because that would be direct to consumer. And then I've had uh, a couple of them under the LFPP implementation grants because they were dealt with an indirect type of thing where they weren't really the, they weren't out there on the boat. Maybe they were, or they were, you can have one, small percentage of them having raised or caught the the product but the majority has to come from somewhere else kind of thing you're the middle person um okay. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. we have a question from from buck jones out in the columbia river um about whether it's a is it possible to apply to two different projects? So one has separate scope of work than the other, um, uh, which has um, which is more of a collaboration with multiple partners. If if uh, the applicant again, if it's the same applicant applying, then and it's under the same if it's if they're both under FMPP and they're, or they're both under LFPP and it's the same applicant applying, then no, you have to choose. If you, if, if I'm applying as the main person and Jordan and Josh are my partners and they have uh, responsibility on task one or two, then they have another, we have a totally another uh, uh, project that's not even fitting with this one. And Josh takes the lead on that. And 
myself and Jordan are his partners on, on doing and collaborating and doing another task, but they have to be, then yes, then you're in there on that, but they have to be different. Buck, does that you answer your question? Take, you can't take the lead on both. Yep. Thank you. And it looks like Buck says that makes yeah, sense. That, that, that really answers the question. I would not be applying um, for both of them. They'd probably be another partner. And then I would uh, apply in, on that second one. Great. Thank you. I'm going to um, turn the last word for this question and answers over to Ronald. It looks like you have a, a question or comment. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to Jordan to wrap things up. Go for it. Um, with the regional, so going back to the previous uh, question, uh, question about the uh, partnership, would the regional food system partnership apply if, say, for instance, all of the participants on this call would like to uh, form a partnership or network um, to say, hey, this is what we got um, product-wise, business-wise, best strategies, practices, um, business practices, what have you, or like workshops in different parts of the region for different things that we've done. So like I heard folks from Alaska, uh, folks in Maine, I'm down on Chesapeake Bay. Would the regional food system partnership, even though I described the national um, thing, would the regional food system? Oh, okay. No. Mm -hmm. That's not what that one is about. But Ronald, just to, to build off of that for a second, the local catch network, we used the farmer's market promotion program to to build out, help to support building out this national network of, of people engaged in local and direct marketing of seafood. And so that is a, a, an avenue you could potentially use to build national uh, connections um, because it's all, all around technical assistance. So if you frame it within that scope, it seems to work. Um, uh, I wanna acknowledge um, quickly a, a, a chat here uh, from Tanya uh, about a decision uh, tree that uh, has been developed to help people think through which which grants to to apply for. Tony, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, it's just a nice shorthand um, description that offers some of what Kim was talking about already. Um, so people might want to use that just to keep refresh their memory or just check against what their project ideas are and see what fits where. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks for bringing that one up. Yeah, I've, I've found it really helpful because it's hard to keep it all straight. So um, just thought I'd pass that on. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, um, I work for Farm to Institution New England, which is a network organ support organization in New England. So any of you all that are thinking about the institutional market side of things, we're also offering some support. I'm here to like listen and learn and support. And if there's anything we can do, I'm happy to help in any way. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. That's a that's really great to have you on this call. I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan. I think one of the things that stands out to me about this call is that a lot of you are asking specific questions about projects that you are thinking about right now. And part of what we've been thinking about today was the idea was just to provide sort of a high level opportunity to ask questions and to review the two RFPs that, that we're, we're most focused on. Uh, but the Local Catch Network is, is offering a set of technical assistance services that, that hopefully will get in the weeds a little bit more. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan to chat about uh, what we have in the pipeline for the next few weeks. And um, thank you all for the opportunity to, or thank you all for, for taking part in this call today. So with that Jordan, it's all yours. Thanks, yeah. And I also wanna give Kim a huge thank you for fielding those questions. Um, so I am having a little trouble sharing my screen, but I'm gonna try, so bear with me just for a moment. All right, are we good? Everyone can see this, hopefully. All right, awesome. So like Josh said, we are gonna be providing some technical assistance um, in partnership with USDA. So we have limited time slots available for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. Priority will be given to black, indigenous and communities of color as well as local catch network members. Um, we have four different areas of technical assistance that we will be providing. 
One will be answering questions about application requirements and eligibility. Two will be early proposal consultation and assistance with project development. Three will be a review of your draft proposals if you want somebody to take a look at those and provide feedback. And then four is the technical review of proposals. So that's just making sure you have all of your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Um, we ask that you sign up for TA through this link. I'll have Josh drop it in the chat and we'll also send it out in those email communications following the session. If um, those sessions are full, um, I suggest that you email us at info at localcatch.org so we can find time to accommodate you. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is we have an upcoming workshop session. So we actually have somebody who spent 26 years at AMS um, and with the USDA who will be helping us to facilitate this workshopping session. Um, we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into the FMLFPP priority areas, um, talking to you about how to interpret grant RFAs and the requests within those, and then how to strengthen project ideas and proposals with your peers. So this is a session that um, will have Again, similarly to today, um, some high level overview um, of these different areas, but then we really want to take most of the session for peers to come together and kind of troubleshoot and brainstorm with one another to strengthen their proposals. That is gonna be coming up on June 2nd um, and we will include the registration link um, in that follow-up email that we send out to you all. I also want to flag the USDA has some upcoming events. So like Kim had mentioned, there's going to be a whole session about how to go through um, the grants.gov process. So, um, so they're going to be able to walk you through that process. Um, there's going to be a farmer's market and local food permission program applicant webinar to provide a little more information about these FMLFPP grants. And then there's going to be one specifically about regional food systems partnerships. Um, that's gonna be coming up at the beginning of June. So that is all we have for now. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in today and asking these amazing questions. Our hope is that we can provide as much assistance to you as possible throughout your application process. And Kim, again, I cannot thank you enough for being on the call and helping us um, Guide, guide us through all of these questions. Um, so we look forward to working with you all and please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I wanted to say really quickly one more thing. Um, the timeline for these grants are, are pretty tight. And so I would say if you are seriously considering applying for funding and don't already have your SAMS number or your DUNES number set up or, or yourself set up in grants.gov, um, I would highly suggest you look into doing that as soon as possible. Um, Kathleen does have a question about how to contact you, Kim, if you are available and willing to um, maybe- sure, I'll, I'll put it in the chat, but guys, I cannot stress enough that if you do not have a SAMS number or a DUNS number, you need to go onto our website onto how to apply and the links are there. It, 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 it's not an overnight deal. And uh, with the grants all coming in, the, the queue is long. And so uh, it could take one to two business days. I've had it take weeks for people. Don't, and if you have one, please make sure that it's up to date because they, um, they don't, they also have a queue for that on getting them uh, reactive. So make sure that it's gonna stay active through uh, October 1st on that. Uh, our deadline on ours is June 21st at 1159 PM Eastern Standard Time. Don't wait until the 21st of June to put your application in. Everyone seems to, and it locks up. Grants.gov will lock up and just because uh, that's not an, ex we, we won't accept them. If they, if they come in after 11.59 p.m. on June 21st, 
I'm sorry. Yeah. So I suggest not waiting until the 21st. And then you use, you should get an email from grants.gov that they have gotten your application. Make sure that you uh, check that checklist at the beginning of the RFA on what um, is required. Do not attach in the paper clip, attach on the 425. If you put it on that paper clip, it will not go through and we won't get it and it'll be uh, kicked out. Thank you, did Kim. You yeah, did you wanna say, do you need to say something about the match or not? I think, yeah, I think that would be great um, as people start to think through that process. If you wouldn't mind talking about the difference between the 10% and 25 and how that'll be allocated, that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, normally, the local food and farmers market is a 25% match. It's 25% match through the farm bill. The 10% match was only due to the COVID. They felt like if some folks could not do a 25% match, they would, Congress decided to do the 10% match. If your organization can do 25% match, do 25% match and leave the 10% match to those that can't. Uh, what we're going to do is we have to allocate that first 7.4 mil, the annual, which is at 25% match first. Then we'll go to the 10%. But if, every, if everyone does 10%, uh, you're ranked, you, you may have been a uh, high ranked in the 25, but now you're lower in the 10. We'll go through the tens, and if we once we get rid of all that monies, we move over to the 25% matches. So please don't uh, look strongly at that. And and if you can do a 25% match, do a 25% match. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about that before we wrap up? All right. Oh, sorry, Charlie, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. I'm uh, Charlie Abner. I'm a shrimper, a commercial uh, fisherman out of Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, the question that I have, well, I probably should have asked it earlier. Um, would we have available to us the information as to everyone attending the seminar, this um, webinar today, to where we could contact them in the future? you know, to, to form some type of working relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, is, as long as everyone's comfortable with sharing that information, I, when I send out that email, um, all of those emails will be um, on it. And um, I could also potentially share, um, there's a spreadsheet list um, with the with everyone's names and their email contacts. Um, so as long as everybody is comfortable with that, I, I'm happy to share that. I think that would be wonderful. I have one other question. I'm, uh, I'm putting together, matter of fact, not only am I putting together, I've already put together a, um, a complete young fishermen, commercial fishermen training program to train younger fishermen because once the older guys you know, uh, retire or even die out. There's no one to take over for, from them. And if anyone is interested in participating or having an up, you know, participating in that, I would love for them to get in contact with me. And my, I believe you all already have the information. Now, the question regarding the grants and the qualifications, um, I've already, uh, well, it was discussed earlier, and I think our organization fall within those uh, guidelines. So I appreciate the information highly. Oh, that's great to hear, Charlie. Yeah, we'd love to hear more about your project and we'd be happy to um, share it with our network as well. So you and I should touch base after after this call too. Anytime. Hey, Charlie, hey, Charlie yes, did you hear about this federal bill that just passed called the Young Fishermen's Development Act? Is that ring oh, yeah, I, 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 read, I read quite a bit uh, 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 regarding it, I just need to do some more research and to see how I can, you know, um, incorporate that with what uh, uh, we have planned. 
I can help you with that. Uh, a lot of the, fund, the funding hasn't really come through yet, but we had a lot to do with working on getting that bill done and we're real happy about it. And I'd be glad to share whatever I got with you. Okay, I really appreciate that. And, and get in contact with me um, soon. I'm up here in, uh, on, in north, well, north of Atlanta. And I've always, all, also have some very, very good contact and some information and uh, and how these young individuals will be provided for us. So please get in contact with me as soon as possible. All right. My, my only advice, uh, other advice, guys, is to go online to see who's been awarded in 2020 or even 2019 in your area and um, contact them. Or if you see someone, you can contact, I've left my phone number and email in there. I can get their contact information. I've told all of, I call them my peeps, my, my grantees. Uh, if someone reaches out to them, that they are to to give them some you know to listen to them give them some advice on how to apply and and everything and and who knows they might be a good partner in in your area you never know i tell tell them all you know network 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 but i feel free to call or um email me i'll certainly try to help if i don't know the answer i will find it on that well, thank you again so much, Kim. And I'm really happy to see all of these connections being made over this call. And again, I encourage you to attend our workshopping session. That might be another opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better and understand your projects and collaborate on projects in the future. So we will be sending out communications, like I said, um, following this session. And um, just thank you all again for your time being here. And we're really looking forward to the amazing projects that, that come out of this group. Um, so I'm going to close it out, but if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact um, Josh or I, um, and then Kim also has left her contact information that I will share in that follow-up email that I send out. All right. Thanks all. Have a great day. Have a great day.